Good afternoon. Uh, uh, just a first, a, a quick statement of condolence with respect to the uh, tragic incident that occurred out of Fort AP Hill involving the Boy Scouts. I think the Boy Scouts have had a press conference uh, with some details. I'm not in a position to ex expand on that, but we obviously uh, send our condolences to the families involved. It's obviously a terrible tragedy, and um, th as I understand, the Boy Scouts and the Army will do a safety stand down today and then continue with the jamboree and I think that's uh, a wonderful decision on their part but it's obviously a very sad day for the Boy Scouts and we extend our condolences. Uh, General Conway, I, I don't know if you have an opening statement. Nothing. If not, we can just get into sure. Q&A if we'd like. Um, General Conway, uh, Al-Qaeda has released a tape of uh, two Algerian, kidnapped Algerian, at least they claim the two kidnapped Algerian diplomats in Dubai. They say they're going to kill them. The rest of the Algerian diplomatic corps left the embassy yesterday. Um, are U.S. troops now going to start protecting diplomats in, in Baghdad? Well, there is a level of protection that takes place right now, Charlie, uh, with regard to patrols and, and the routine uh, types of efforts that both the Iraqis and, and the U.S. forces uh, are providing as they, as they work the streets of Baghdad. Uh, those that, that are inside the green zone are further protected. Uh, but, uh, but no, I do not expect at all uh, that there would be U.S. forces detailed uh, to protect foreign diplomats. Sir. Um, General Conway, uh, General Jack Keane, the former Vice Chief of the Army, has apparently just come back from Iraq, and he has said at a luncheon yesterday that, um, that U.S. forces had either captured or killed some 50,000 insurgents so far this year. Um, is that number accurate? Can you tell us how many were captured or how many were killed and, and whether or not, and what that says about the size of the insurgency? I just saw the article this morning, um, and I accept the fact that, that General Keene has, has uh, been in country certainly since I have. Uh, I can't speak to his source of the figures. Uh, I can tell you that we don't keep that metric here, so I'm afraid I can't confirm or deny uh, the, the accuracy of those figures. I mean, U.S. forces are constantly rolling up, uh, and Iraqi forces are rolling up suspected insurgents. Some are held, some are, are released. Uh, do you not, can you, either one of you give us any idea of how many are being held now, and does the number seem uh, reasonable? And, and, and setting the number aside for a moment, what does it say about the size of the insurgency if there have been numbers in that range? Well, you know, it's, it's uh, something that commanders have been asked on many occasions. I, I think the Secretary has certainly been asked it. Uh, it's an interesting thing to understand, you know, what's the size of the adversary that we're facing, and, and the estimates have ranged from a, a few thousand on the low end to many tens of thousands on the high end. I, this now, this uh, comment that General Keene has made. I, it's not a number that we do track. Uh, it's, it's, uh, there's, we are capturing or killing a large number of, in, of, of bad guys in Iraq. Uh, we are detaining a large number of people who are under investigation either as criminal elements or potential insurgents from whom we can gather additional information. But, it, you know, we, we don't tend to count, we're not, nobody's maintaining a count of, of the size of the insurgency or the numbers that we're, that we're capturing because as we've discussed from here and elsewhere uh, before Congress, it's not a, it's not, First of all, it's not a metric that has a lot of meaning by itself, and secondly, it's, it's a difficult thing to do, and, and for the effort that would be expended, one would have to wonder what we'd have at the end of the day if we were able to count it with, with precision. Our, what we're trying to do is understand the nature of it. Uh, ultimately, we believe and, and are f fairly confident that the nature of it is, is one that will, will uh, be overtaken by the continued progress in Iraq and by the Iraqi people themselves, but the numbers themselves are uh, 
they're, they're mis they can be misleading. I mean, we, we see large numbers of, of Iraqi civilians being killed by the insurgents. We don't track those numbers either, but it, it leaves an impression that the progress in Iraq is, is, is uh, less than it is because it's misleading by itself, and, and it's just not something that we're tracking. General Keene also said that the U.S. has a pretty good idea of the leadership of the insurgency. He mentioned that uh, eight to ten leaders occasionally meet, and that that was something that, uh, that was known. Can you comment on, on that and whether that's accurate? Is there a, do you know if there's a core of eight to ten leaders? Have they met? I think those statements are accurate. Um, I uh, uh, was starting to get into some classified type of, of material at this point, uh, but we have uh, have an index we think on who the leadership is, uh, and we do know that they occasionally meet. That doesn't uh, portend, uh, I, I think, uh, other views that it is a, a very well uh, commanded or controlled insurgency, uh, but we do know that they meet from time to time to talk uh, organization and tactics. General Conway, uh, Sally Donnelly from Time. Uh, Mr. Dorita just said those numbers, the 50,000, don't really have meaning, but th they also don't have maybe some understanding. I don't know whether that's a real number. Is that an accurate number? And and it's, uh, I guess it's hard for people outside the military to understand how they could have 50,000 captured or killed, and the insurgency still seems to have a good amount of strength. Well, in my own, on my own behalf, <laughs> let, me, let me clarify, <laughs> Sally. Yeah, I know you did. Um, I've been doing this for a little while now. I'm, there's a lot to go, but the uh, we're, what we're saying is we don't know if that number has any validity. Not that it's it's a number that we aren't interested in. We just don't know if it's valid. And and to to draw a conclusion from a number that we don't think is even valid would itself be an invalid conclusion. So if it's fifty thousand, that leads you to one thing. If it's two thousand, and we've seen estimates on the very low end, then that leads you to other conclusions. And and it yet it's still the question is how much have you learned about the insurgency? Uh, you learn a thing by knowing the size of it, but it's, it by itself is not definitive. But uh, the, to, to be very clear, we're not saying 50,000 we don't care. We're saying we don't know. There's a difference. Can you just take the question? And, and now General Conway would like to add the, to embellish the, even further what you've well, said. Well, there is one more factor that they're starting to crank in. And you're going to see it even increasingly, I think, have impact as the Iraqi both police and, and military forces come online. That is, when they operate independently, we don't get their reports necessarily. So uh, numbers of their injured uh, or killed uh, when they're on operation, uh, numbers that they roll up, uh, we don't have as a direct feed through the multinational core or, or MNF at that point. Somebody asked if I could take the question. The question I'd be happy to take is I'll try and get a little bit better clarity from General Keene what it was he was, he believed he was referring well, to. If maybe you could just take the question of how many Iraqis are now in custody. That should be a number that you... Yeah, I, I'll tell you, I can, I can full stop put aside 50,000, put aside any other assumptions or questions. I will try and find out from General Keene or maybe General Conway will what he was referring to. Now, lay all that aside. We're probably detaining inside of Iraq without, under, without knowing uh, the mix between bad guys, criminals, car thieves, uh, people who were in the wrong place at the wrong time, and it's going to take time to sort all that out. Uh, probably somewhere between, uh, and you can check me on this, General, but I think we're on the order of 12 to 16, 17,000. Uh, and that number fluctuates a lot. Sometimes we'll, there'll be large numbers released. Uh, but that, that number, it would be wrong to equate in the sentence following, here's what they said about Keene's number, that number and say this is the better number because that's a very different number. It's who we're holding on to. It's a mix of people that includes criminals and people that may not even be need to be detained, but it's going to take time to sort that out because they were in the wrong place at the wrong time. That's for them. The 50,000 number could, in fact, refer to people who were uh, rolled up, uh, detained, and then subsequently released. Aren't a large percentage I, I, of people released at some point? Yeah, I, I, he said killed or captured, so I, I don't – that's the words that were attributed to him anyway. So we'll try and get a better understanding, and we did, in fact, try and – discuss it with General Keene this morning. He was unavailable. We'll try and get a better sense of what he was referring to, but what I am distinctly not referring to in that twelve to 15,000 number is, is something along the lines of what he was saying. So, uh, Brian, and then we'll come back. Yeah, Larry, uh, General Myers uh, mentioned uh, some of his comments, of his thoughts about the, the word terrorism last night. Vice President Cheney is talking about global war on terror. It seems that for over a year now we've been hearing, you know, depending on who you're talking to, you hear extremism, terrorism. What is the thinking of the administration now? Is this a, a war on terrorism? Is terrorism a tactic? Is terrorism uh, actually what you're fighting yeah. against? What? It's, a, it's an interesting question. First of all, I don't speak for the administration, uh, but I in the department, the secretary has often spoken about uh, the struggle against global extremism. 
from the following perspective, as General Meyer said, when one considers it a war that has certain connotations, it, there is in fact a war on terrorism going on, but it, 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 that should be understood in a much broader context than military operations in Afghanistan and Iraq, which for understandable reasons has become the focus for the general public. And those are important aspects to the global war on terror, but our, pers our understanding is, as the President discussed this right after 9-11, a broader uh, range of national influence that will be needed to prevail in this struggle against uh, what, it, what essentially is uh, radical Islamic fundamentalism that is at the moment using terrorism as a tactic. And the 9-11 Commission report talked about that as well. In fact, the 9-11 Commission report has a good, very good discussion about this. So it's, uh, it, it, we are indeed in a global war on terror. Uh, Iraq, as the President has pointed out, is in fact at the moment the central front in that war on terror. But the range of activities that are that this country is focused focused on to defeat this 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 extremist element in the world goes well beyond needs to go well beyond and is indeed goes well beyond um, just military activity. Uh, uh, you know, recently, a, a general uh, said that uh, calling it a glo global war on terrorism is like calling World War II, you know, the war on submarines. That it's a tactic. It's it's something that insurgents are using. It, does it somehow confuse the public? Does it somehow confuse the world to call it a, a war on terrorism? Do you have a thought on that, sir? No, I, I, I agree with what both you and, and, and Ari have said, that it is a tactic and it's not a tangible uh, with, uh, uh, with which you, you engage. Um, global, I think, is appropriate, uh, both in terms of, of the nature of the threat and in terms of the nature of uh, the, the number of countries uh, that are engaged. So I, I think that part of it certainly certainly needs to stand. But the, let me, but to take on the, the, the thought behind that, we're facing an enemy with an ideology. It, it has a worldview. General Abizade and others have spoken about it. The State Department, uh, various State Department uh, uh, leaders, diplomats have spoken about it. This is an ideology. They, there's a belief in a return to the caliphate, a, a, a sort of fundamentalist Islamic rule in the world under a single leadership. They believe in something, and, and it would be it's important to remind people that we're facing an enemy that believes in something, and it's ultimately, as Prime Minister Blair said re very eloquently recently, that that this is an evil ideology that's going to be defeated through the through the um, the full range of of influence that goes with with self government and freedom, and and those are going to be the intangibles that, in effect, what we're talking about in Iraq, that the Iraqi people, through their own expression of self government and, and their own expression of freedom, will defeat this insurgency. Uh, much more permanently and effectively than, than, you know, 17 U.S. brigades or however many coalition brigades. I would add it is a discussion that uh, has been had philosophically with our allies, uh, and we've been told actually that global war on terrorism uh, translates pretty well into the various languages. So I think uh, that continues to make it a part of the discussion. Yes, sir, and then we'll come back. <clears throat> Guy Taylor from the Washington Times. Larry, just to finish up on the, the Keen remarks, uh, he is a retired... General, is that right? I believe that's how so one might describe the former Vice Chief of Staff of the United States Army. Is there some frustration about uh, retired brass uh, making sweeping and potentially uh, remarks about potentially uh, inaccurate or confidential things to the media? That, that is there frustration here? Are you asking me if I have any frustration with General Keene? The answer is absolutely and affirmatively no. So. How about the, the sort of broad, the broad spectrum of retired... I told you I've been doing this a while. <laughs> I'm on to you guys. A retired brass that speak... speak They're all entitled to their views. They serve their country well. They, they're retired. A lot of these retired general officers uh, uh, are indeed employed in the services of people who are paying them for their views. But they're entitled to have their views, and we take those as they come. General Keene has made his comments, but General Keene's comments are based on travel to the region. Uh, he's a member of the Defense Policy Board. Uh, this is not in an, not by means of trying to give any validity to his statement because I just don't know what he said and what it was based on. But he is a he is a uh, he is someone whose views and judgments are worthy of the respect that they get. Tom, was he over there on some kind of official official Pentagon mission to find out this? Oh, I mean. He, he has been in the past. I don't know if in this particular. We've not spoken with him. So when we, when I, as I've taken this point, this question, I'll be, I'll, I'll, I'll get a better sense of what his most recent visit was and what he was off doing and that sort of thing. He has in the past gone over there. Tom. 
General, I'd like your comments on one aspect of the implications of deployments to Iraq using both the fact that you've taken the MEF downrange and now in your joint role. The Marine Corps for a couple of years and for the future foreseeably will be doing heel-to-toe, back-to-back rotations to Iraq. Doctrinally, that's not really what the Marines do. It sounds a bit more like a campaign plan, which the Army does. I'm just curious whether you think this is just a blip in Marine Corps history, or as the Army tries to get lighter and the Marines are carrying out a campaign, whether the public is served by having two separate ground forces. And Larry, is this something that's in the QDR? Has the Secretary raised a similar question? Thank you. Um, the Marine Corps uh, does what it needs to do in defense of the nation. And uh, you're right, typically this is not something that, that Marine Forces uh, would uh, uh, would find doctrinally uh, appropriate, but uh, the Army uh, has been involved with this modularization. Uh, the requirement against numbers of brigades have been such that the Army could not man it without some help from, from the Reserves and the National Guards and do modularization at the same time. Uh, so there was a need for Marine regiments uh, to step up to the plate, and, and they did. Uh, and, you know, there's an old expression in the Marine Corps, we do windows. So whatever the nation's requirement is, you're going to find Marines there uh, participating. And I think uh, any Marine you talk to will say if there's fighting and, and, and dying to be done, they're going to be a part of that. On the, on the second aspect of your question, Tom, the, uh, the issue is a component of the QDR in an indirect sense. Uh, how we size and organize the forces uh, for the range of assumptions on how those forces may need to be used uh, is – was a central uh, result of the last QDR. It's a it's an important question in this QDR. First, to challenge the decisions that we made in 01. In other words, how do we feel about those four years later with all the experience we've gained? And then projecting assumptions uh, through the course the QDR has us project through the life of the of the budget, if you will, the five years. Our best uh, attempt to sort of project how those forces would need to be employed in the future and and therefore how they would need to be organized and, and, uh, and sized. So yeah, it, it, it's, it's, it doesn't take the question on precisely the way you framed it, but, but it's, the outcome will likely be the same. In other words, are we organized? The modularity question in the Army is, is does that make sense? And if so, at what size? Uh, and, and, and the same applies to the other uh, military departments and, and how are they arranged in order to, to maintain what we are increasingly getting comfortable with this idea of operational availability. How quickly can they be brought to the fight and in what units? It's an important component of this QDR and we're learning a lot about that. Over here, Tom. General, uh, on Syria, do you, no do you notice, are you noticing any increased cooperation by the Syrian government to try to stem the uh, cross-border infiltration? General Custer from CENTCOM last month said they are doing what they can. Not enough, but they're doing something. Uh, some is, is the answer to your question, I think. We would like to see more. Uh, we still consider that uh, Syria is, is probably uh, the most porous border of those that, uh, that, that border Iraq. Um, we uh, were encouraged that there's some discussion of moving additional Syrian forces uh, to that border. Haven't seen it yet, uh, but it would be a welcome addition. They have done some improvement on, on the, the physical berm that exists between the, uh, the two countries. Uh, so I would say we're encouraged, but we would still like to see more. You're encouraged what, in the last month or so, or is this, is this a recent development? Uh, I, would, I would say within the last uh, couple, two or three months. Larry, can I ask you a, a China question? Uh, implications from the report that was released last week. The is, China military report? The China military report. Uh, is the Pentagon at all looking at working with the State Department or other countries to tighten exports, technology exports to China in light of the findings of that report last week? Uh, I wouldn't, I wouldn't focus it on just China. I mean, the, 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 we're working closely with the State Department on a number of issues with respect to export sensitivity. I mean, the Proliferation Security Initiative is the is the umbrella uh, operation for that in that perspective. Um, but we're we're looking at ways that we can be mindful of of uh, a, a range of countries and how they use technology that they get through various export agreements, and, and it's an important question. I, I wouldn't say that we're focused on China. In fact, we're, we're not focused on China. No, we're focused on the capabilities that could arise because countries misuse uh, technology that's been exported to them, and it's, 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 a, it's a concern that is not uh, unique to an, any particular country. So.
General Conway, on the uh, global war on terror, how, how concerned is the Defense Department about uh, uh, increasing signs of extremism uh, taking root in regions of Africa? And, and what's being done uh, in the long term to train uh, nations there? Yeah, uh, there's a, a joint task force called Joint Task Force Horn of Africa uh, that I think uh, is perhaps a good model uh, for us to, to look towards, uh, both in terms of its current effectiveness and perhaps even employment in the future. Uh, we call it an economy of force function uh, in, in the vernacular, but essentially what it, it uh, does is engage is something over a thousand troops uh, and officers and a headquarters uh, to strengthen the resolve uh, and the capability of, of nations in the region so that they don't become uh, the next harbor site for terrorists. Uh, and, and again, it seems to us a very effective use of, uh, of troops. Uh, looking at those places where you could see terrorists start to move uh, when they leave Afghanistan, when they leave Iraq, and it, it precludes that next uh, location, if you will, where we might have to engage. Have there been signs of, troop, of insurgents from Iraq and Afghanistan going to Africa? There, there, is, there is flow, uh, not, not specifically to, to the location of the Horn of Africa, and that may be an indication of how well they're doing. Uh, but we, we track what we think are, are terrorist movement zones, and, uh, and Africa is, uh, is, is included in that, uh, in that observation. Have there been any high-value detainees in that, in that region over uh, the last six months, not, years? Uh, not in the recent, uh, recent past, no. It's also an area, uh, more broadly, that we're, you know, the Department of Defense has not traditionally had the mission of training equip of, of foreign uh, uh, militaries. Uh, and it's one we're working closely with the State Department and the Congress to expand our authorities in those areas. We feel it's an, a very important aspect of being able to enable other countries with, with pretty modest investments up front and some interaction with our forces to become a lot more capable quickly uh, a, a, a across a, ran a minimum range of, of activities. So it's, it's an area that's very important to this department and to the government generally, and we're working closely to uh, review authorities and, and see that we have the authorities that may be desirable in, in, a, in a very different world from the world that w existed when the original authorities were more restricted on, on our ability to do those kinds of things. General, there have been some uh, fairly significant clashes in Afghanistan in recent weeks. One yesterday left a U.S. soldier uh, killed. Do you have any details about that one northwest of Kandahar? And can you speak more broadly about the enemy in Afghanistan as you move towards this uh, parliamentary election yeah. in September? Uh, the, one, the one yesterday, Brett, uh, we, we call southwest of a place called Da, da Waywood, same, same location I think you're talking about. We lost uh, a soldier. Uh, we had two wounded. Uh, the Afghan National Army lost one and, and had uh, a soldier wounded. Uh, size of the force not known. There have been uh, open source reports today that talk about as many as 50 being killed. Uh, we, we can't verify that. What we did do after we swept through the position, having brought in uh, attack helicopters and artillery, a couple pieces of artillery, uh, was to find uh, uh, numbers of weapons, ammunition, binoculars, uh, GPS devices, some of those types of things that represented that a, a, a force had been there. Now, my observation, tracking this day in and day out, uh, is that virtually every time the Taliban come up against our, our regular forces, are those of the Afghan National Army, they're losing pretty badly. And what we suspect over time is that they're going to be driven to the standoff tactics that we see being employed in Iraq, because they can't sustain those kinds of losses, or our view, and, and continue to remain viable. Uh, we're hearing reports now that they're attempting to recruit 14 through 16-year-olds uh, to their cause because uh, older and wiser uh, Afghanis uh, are simply not buying into, uh, into the rhetoric. But the attacks are not based solely along the border anymore. They're, they're more inside the country as you head towards the election. I mean, is it more widespread than just the uh, border? The, the, the border is still, if, if you populated a map, it would still be predominantly along the border. Uh, that's where the refuge is to be found. That's where perhaps they can escape across the border and, 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 and find some, uh, some opportunity to get away from our forces. Uh, if, if you further the plot, it would go a short ways in, inland, but not very far uh, into the rest of the country. Uh, the, the north and, uh, and the northwest portions of the country are, are relatively peaceful and are getting on with life and, and uh, life in a, a democracy. Let me ask you about an issue that was raised by a press release put out by Task Force Baghdad in which they uh, quoted at the end of the release uh, an anonymous Iraqi calling the insurgents enemies of humanity. It turned out that the, the colorful quote was identical to one that was in a press release issued about uh, a week earlier. Have you, have you figured out what happened here and are uh, 
are uh, the press people using stock quotes uh, in their press releases? Well, we're getting close to understanding it better, and I think we've the folks that are involved in theater have have tried to understand it very carefully. First of all, I think they, the the quote may have been modestly modified, but the basic point is accurate that they appear to have used a second quote in a, in another statement. It's uh, it it's uh, first of all the use of anonymous quotes in Department of Defense statements is unacceptable, and yeah, it, it's completely unacceptable. It was done for reasons that I'm not I don't understand very well yet, but I intend to understand better. It's um, it's uh, probably reflects a, a certain uh, rush to get something out on an important activity that occurred that uh, may have may have benefited from a little better rigor than it got as the statement was being developed. We're, we're developing a little bit better understanding of what exactly happened, but if there's a need to tighten up our procedures, we certainly will. I mean, it's um, it's 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 troubling, and we're trying to understand a little bit better. If the journalists were to uh, make up a quote or, or copy a quote or uh, misuse a quote like that, you could lose a job. In fact, some have. Is anyone being disciplined? Well, in this? we're going to gather the facts first and then determine what the actions are. I want to make sure that we have processes in place to avoid this from happening, first and foremost, and then we'll, uh, I'll, we'll get a better sense of exactly individual accountability that may need to be uh, established. I, I just don't know enough about the facts yet. For instance, even the original quote was accurate, or is it something? I don't made know up? that. I don't know that. It's one of the obvious questions we're trying to understand. But I will emphasize that y you should, because I do, question uh, a, a Department of Defense press statement that would have an anonymous source in it. It's it's not acceptable, and uh, it's I, I under I understand the desire to put out as as, as expansive a press statement as is determined to be needed. Uh, because an important activity occurred and, and the folks on the ground want to make sure that that activity is, is understood in all its range of complexity. But it, there's ways to do that, and it doesn't appear that they followed all the ways to do that here. I conclude from that, since uh, you uh, have the position that you have, that that guidance has been sent down and that we won't be seeing any more anonymous quotes and press Well, members. we're going to reaffirm the guidance. Whether or not it's followed is always a, uh, an exciting question. But. Could you call a status on a couple of uh, major issues? One, do we know, does the U.S. know definitively what shut down the, the Chinook on June 29th? We have anything to Rocket offer propelled grenade. That's been definitively established. Okay. Second, uh, I, I've asked this before, but the Mosul suicide bombing back in uh, December, we still haven't got a final word on what happened. Can you give us a sense of where the investigation is? And, Mike's tickets are down. I do not, I'm sorry. We'll take that one. It's, it, these, these things are complicated. They take time. I, I, I agree that it, it, uh, it would be desirable to get these things wrapped up, but at the moment I don't have anything for you. Uh, can, can you check? I mean, it's we'll check on it. Nine months. You know, Larry, the, the BRAC Commission seems to be leaning in the direction of making major, uh, at least substantial changes to the, uh, to the, pen, the DOD recommendations, particularly mm -hmm. in the Air National Guard, maybe some other areas as well. How much change would the secretary be willing to accept before he would recommend to the president to reject what the BRAC Commission report? Well, first of all, I wouldn't want to prejudge, even based on what the BRAC Commission has asked for additional information, what, their, what the commission will end up doing. The commission has an important role in the process that was established by Congress, so we've acknowledged from the beginning that we anticipate the commission would review our recommendations carefully and may indeed make changes. I think uh, in the past there's been a 10 to 15 percent change rate in, in recommendations that go from the Department of Defense to the BRAC Commission. So one shouldn't be surprised to see that number higher or lower. Um, I, I, I won't handicap what the Secretary's response would be to you know any individual changes. The one point we've made consistently, and I think that the BRAC Commission certainly understands this, is that you know we made decisions and we made recommendations that were based on a, a, a fairly matrixed set of considerations, and it's difficult to reach into one recommendation and pull out something that is based on quite a range of considerations and and we've but we've made that well understood to the commission the commission has a role to play though and they sh they deserve the opportunity to play that role and and I don't want to be in a position to prejudge what a re what our response would be to a, a decisions that they haven't even made yet so we'll give it time to Mike general there were some reports uh, earlier this week that um, the uh, the head of Abu Sayyaf in the Philippines may have been captured in a, a raid or attack or something along those lines. Um, do you know anything about uh, about that? And B is uh, 
Abu Sayyaf um, uh, increasing in power again in, uh, in the Philippines? Uh, I have, haven't heard anything about uh, uh, John Jelani being captured. Uh, I, I would dare say that's probably not accurate, or we would have heard it. I do know uh, that the Philippine Army uh, is increasing in its professionalism. Uh, we have forces that work with them, and uh, that they, they are in the field uh, consistently operating against the, the ASG, the Abu Sayyaf group. Uh, that's probably as much as I can say at this point. The Philippine Army is in the field. That's right. Yeah. Can you provide any additional uh, just context for the re report that was released yesterday by both state and the, uh, and the Pentagon about the training of the Iraqi police forces? It seemed to have some pretty uh, critical language about the vetting process and the quality of recruits. Yeah, the, the, uh, we've said all along that the vetting, the best vetting is that when you hire one of these guys, everybody comes out and says, that's a bad guy. Uh, and we've had lots of people identified in that very way. Uh, we've unfortunately had people identified because they've, they've become targets of, of uh, uh, military activity. Uh, the report that was done by the, it was a joint Department of State, Department of Defense, Inspector General analysis of police training. Police training is conducted under the auspices of the Ministry of Interior inside of Iraq. Um, it, it highlighted a number of uh, kind of fairly specific recommendations to get the Iraqis more involved in the vetting process. I think General Petraeus took the recommendations for what they were, which was a good, quick look, a snapshot of, of uh, some very thoughtful people that went out there and, and uh, made a number of recommendations. So uh, I, I, it, it's a bit dated. I think they did this back in the spring, and, and the, re the report coming out in July reflects, I think, knowledge as of April, if I'm not mistaken. But the, the general conclusions are that there's – progress, but that, uh, you know, it's an uneven circumstance when you're trying to vet these people, and I think that's something that we've known for quite some time. But I'm not trying to dismiss the report. It, it offered quite a number of specific recommendations on ways to improve that, and uh, I think General Petraeus is, has taken those aboard. A layperson just reading that report would get the impression that the, the police training is not going very well, in fact, that it's sort of off track, and that it's not producing a large number of recruits that can actually uh, protect themselves, much less the Iraqi people. Would what is your interpretation of what the report shows? Um, in the, I haven't read the report. I've read just a synopsis of it, um, and, and I'd have to have to understand more the period of observation. In the early going, uh, standing up the Iraqi police force was was essentially a jobs program. Uh, there was not the vetting that that needed to take place for a whole host of reasons, uh, but it's gotten infinitely better. And and uh, I think we all realize that in an insurgency, that the police are going to play. Uh, if, if not the dominant role, certainly a, a critically important role to us. So it's in everybody's best interest that they be as, as good as we can possibly help to make them in conjunction with the Iraqi uh, Ministry of the Interior. Uh, I think probably the best people to vet will be the Iraqi leadership uh, and, and the established uh, Iraqi uh, police force uh, cadre uh, that helps with the training. The training takes place uh, in a number of locations. It's fairly professional. Uh, it's getting better all the time. So uh, I, I'd have to see the report to comment more, uh, but I'm, I'm skeptical that it's as poor as, as perhaps the synopsis would yeah, In fact, I, I'm more than skeptical. It didn't say it's off track, and, I, and I've been briefed on the report and have scanned it pretty carefully. It, it, it said the following things, that the Iraqi police performed well during the January elections. There is increased visibility of police on the streets. Polls indicate a growing public respect for and confidence in the police force. Training is high quality involving international trainers both in Jordan and Iraq, and Iraqi instructors are playing an increasing role in training. Uh, but it also pointed out a lot of things that could be improved, and, and I'll stipulate there's a lot of things that could be improved. Uh, but it, 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 I don't think, it didn't leave me the impression that it was off track. It left me the impression that those things are going on, but also some things that could be done better, including vetting, which is an important concern across the range of security forces, not just police. How about one or two more, and then we'll, or maybe no more. Anything on these uh, demonstrations at Bagram? Uh, all I've read, and it wasn't through official means again, it was, uh, it was open source, was that uh, some people from a local village weren't happy that eight of their tribesmen uh, had been rounded up, uh, yet the operation uh, was a joint uh, U.S.-Afghan National Army operation. They found these people with improvised explosive devices and other materials uh, in their building, so it looks like the arrest was a good one. Uh, I, I have only heard again that there was some uh, overhead fire uh, that broke up the, uh, the demonstration, and I've heard nothing on it since. Okay, we'll make this last one. All right, um, Edward Sun with the Washington Times. Um, given the heat index in Washington, uh, 
how, how do the soldiers in Iraq um, deal with, do they get any uh, relief from the heat or anything of that sort? Yeah. What, what are the efforts? Absolutely. Um, the, uh, we, we have been concerned about uh, that region of the country. It's a brutal region, especially this time of year. Have been concerned about it from the outset. Uh, and there are air conditioners uh, that are brought in, put into the barracks, put into the offices, that type of thing. So although you're out on patrol and it's hot and it's miserable, when you get back in, there is relief. There are some very uh, uh, superb mess halls that are also air conditioned that allow the troops of cancer to, re to regenerate before they go back out again. Thank you. Thanks, folks. Thank you.